Okay, hey, welcome back. We're going to talk about uh, imperialism in Asia real quick. So basically, when we're looking at this time frame of the Industrial Revolution, and shortly before the Industrial Revolution, when Europe in the you know the early 1500s or the late 1400s goes out looking to trade with Europe, that's or I'm sorry, Europe goes looking to trade with Asia. Uh, remember that was the the push for Columbus uh, sailing west across the uh, the Atlantic Ocean. Asia is the most powerful area of the world. They uh, they 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 have all the good stuff that Europe wants. They have silks, porcelain, spices. They have sugars, um, and, and the only way to get those goods to to Europe was through overland trade routes. Um, and Asia would set the prices. They would dictate uh, the terms of trade. And during this time frame, China is uh, vastly superior to every European nation. If you if you kind of think of it like China would be like a senior in high school and the rest of Europe would be like in first or second grade. Um, and so like, you know, you, you would deal with them because you have to, but like China doesn't want to hang out with uh, the rest of Europe on a Friday night, so to speak. And so, you know, China doesn't want to go to Europe. They don't want to set up colonies in Europe. It's not advantageous for them to do so. They're pretty just happy. They're, Asia and Asian nations are pretty just happy to, to, to maintain the status quo where they are, uh, even though they trade all over China, all over Asia with each other, right? China trades with India and all of those places. And so in the next hundred years, by the 1600s, early 1700s, Europe has started to control a small amount of land in Asia. They figured out how to get there by boat. Um, you know, they're taking over uh, some coastal ports in India, um, Indonesia. The Dutch have, have pretty well controlled that area through trade. The Spanish take over the Philippines. The British, uh, by the early 1700s, had begin, begun to colonize Australia. And so you start to see the um, at least the early parts of European industrialization in those areas. Um, what really changes the game is the, the Industrial Revolution, once again, allows Europe to catch up and bypass um, the Asian nations in terms of military power, political power, and trade power. Um, and so Europe goes from really not having things that China wants to maybe starting to interest, pique their interest a little bit. But the big thing is Europe has taken all of the military advances that China has had over the, uh, the early centuries uh, in, in the current era and, and, and um, developed them. Like, you know, we, we have, uh, they, they further developed gunpowder into, uh, into, you know, steel can cannons and, 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 and rifles and, and muskets and those types of things. Uh, and, and they're able to mass produce those because of the industrial revolution and able to produce uh, weaponry that, that China, that China and the rest of Asia doesn't have. And so when, um, they go into Asia and they start to look for ways to colonize those areas. The Europeans are going to have big, big advantages. The um, the uh, the first nation to fall into the hands of of uh, of a European nation, uh, specifically Britain, is going to be India. And before colonization of India, India was ruled by the Mughal Empire. Um, that was strong enough for a long period of time to hold off for the British, or at least prevent the British from gaining major footholds. But in the late 1730s to the 1770s, you see the series of revolts that that lead, uh, that kind of destroy the empire from within. Uh, and, and at least to this divided nation that the, the, the British could really exploit. Um, and so the British start to expand their control of India. The French also move into India during this time and start to set up colonies. Um, and that's going to lead to a one of our first global wars, which is going to be the Seven Years of War that's fought between the British and the French, um, not only in Europe, but in, uh, in North America, in Asia as well, for control of global shipping, right? Uh, and ultimately, the British are going to win, and they're going to take control of all of India, um, along with uh, what was considered New France in North America, which is modern-day Canada. And this is going to be the start for, if you um, remember the uh, the talk about the American uh, the American Revolution, the Seven Years' War, which is called the uh, French and Indian War in North America, is going to be the start of uh, the trouble for the American colonists uh, and Britain in, uh, in North America. But anyways, uh, England creates a monopoly or they create a company to run India. They don't necessarily set it up as a colony. They set it up as a... Uh, as an area that's run by a company, it's called the British East India Company, much like the Dutch 
East India Company during this time frame. And, and, and the British East India Company is going to be in charge of uh, you know trade and exploiting um uh exploiting goods out of out of India to the rest of the uh English uh colonies and empires. And so things like tea and spice and cotton are going to be sold to the rest of the world, as well as importing goods, specifically British textiles that are going to be sold uh to the um people of India. Um, and so they're going to run India for a profit because ultimately the job of a colony is to make money for the parent country. And things are going to go pretty well up until 1857, in which a group of Indian soldiers are going to revolt against the British East India Company and their treatment by that company. And it's, it's referred to as the Sepoy Revolt. Um, and, and the British are going to just um, respond with... Um, Pretty brutal force. They're 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 gonna um they're gonna come in and they're and they're going to just kill as many of these Indian um Indian uh, rioters or uh former sailors and soldiers as they as they can. Uh, and the British are going to take uh, control of India away from the East India Company, and they're going to decide to rule it themselves. And so they're going to rule it as a um, but they're not going to be. It's not going to be a direct rule comp, uh, a direct uh, rule colony, but uh, but it's a little bit more involved than an indirect rule colony. And because India is so important to to the British Empire because of um, its access to those things, teas and spices, and ultimately tobaccos, and just the large population to buy goods, right? And so ultimately, in, uh, India is going to be referred to as the the. Um, the the jewel in the British the crown jewel of the British Empire it's going to be one of the most important uh, most important colonies right uh, and Britain ultimately again uh, rules India not to not to spread uh, cultural influence or whatever but to uh, to make lots of money um, and so there, you know there's there's a small number of British advisors that are there uh, administrators one Britain British administrator for about 3 million uh, people in India, but they're going to hire um, the upper class, the rich uh, from India, and they're going to uh, put them in roles within the government, important roles within the government. They're going to give them certain benefits um, within the government. They're going to you know, give them Western educations. They're going to send their families to England to be absorbed in Western uh, societies. Um, and, and, and so, um, you know, Britain's going to be able to control India um, indirectly those ways, right? The British are going to bring peace and prosperity uh, to India, not for everybody, definitely not for the common people, but for a, you know, a, a, a certain percentage of the upper class of, of India are really going to uh, prosper uh, from the uh, control of Britain. Um, and Britain's going to rule a multinational, multi-ethnic, multi-religious people uh, through a period of, of, of peace. And so um, they're going to modernize the nation with Western science and technology. They're going to improve farming. They're going to improve infrastructure with railroads and, and better ports. And it's going to set in India in a uh, in a position to, to, to modernize or be one of the more modern um, Asian nations uh, when England finally leaves. Uh, but that's not going to happen until like the 1950s. And so England is going to rule India and exploit India really without its consent during this time. Uh, again, they're running them for a profit. That's the whole point of industrial uh, uh, imperialism. Uh, India is going to they're going to start a national movement in the 1850s. And it's going to take about a century uh, and two world wars to kind of show the evils of imperialism. Uh, before India is actually given its independence. And of course, you're going to have the uh, the movements, the nonviolent uh, civil disobedient movements of um, Hamagande uh, to, to lead that. Okay. Um, we'll look at China here during this time frame. And, and China is going to see the shift in dynasties. The Ming dynasty is going to, to go away and the Qin dynasty is, uh, the Qin dynasty is going to, to come about um, and, and when they when the Qin Dynasty, Dynasty takes over, they're going to close off trade, uh, really to the most of the rest of, of the Western world. They're going to leave a couple trade ports open. They're going to only be available a couple months out of the year, um, and, and it's going to really drive the the British uh, crazy in the fact that they can't uh, British and the rest of Europe Europeans crazy. They they can't 
tap into these resources within China or tap into these markets within China. Um, however, you know, 1700s, China fails to industrialize like the rest of Europe and they don't trade. They're not trading with Europe on a regular basis. They're not exchanging um, uh, breakthroughs in technology. And China is going to fall behind very quickly once the rest of Europe begins to industrialize. Um, and so early on in 1600s, 1700s, even into the early 1800s, China is not going to trade for technology or knowledge or or any uh, consumer goods are only going to trade for gold and silver. Uh, and so this puts England and the rest of Europe at a, uh, at, as a trade disadvantage or a trade deficit. And the fact that they're buying things like silks and uh, spices that can be re reproduced with uh, precious metals like gold and silver, which there's a, uh, there's a set amount of, right? And so you're trading silks and spices for gold. And this is a great positive uh, trade balance for China. Um, but in the 1800s, England's looking for a way to change that. And they discover that they have this drug that they can grow in India called opium. It comes from a poppy plant. Um, it's one of the, um, you know, it, well, it's, it's an opiate. Uh, and, um, and, and they start to give it to Chinese merchants or, or make it available like all drug dealers do. And they basically, um, you know, leave it in China and the Chinese start to um, use opium on record scales. It, uh, it's estimated at some point that somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 20% of the, uh, of the Chinese population is, is using opium on a regular basis during the early 1800s. And this is going to cause a huge problem for China, because like, if you ever want a don't do drugs talk, um, you know, I don't know if, if, uh, if, if doing anti drug commercials are really the way to do it. I think they ought to just teach about the, the opium wars and the fact that China was probably one of the most, developed countries in the world, then all of a sudden you introduce opium into it. And within 10 or 15 years, it, it falls victim to being uh, imperialized by almost every Western nation in the world. Um, and so after opium is, is introduced, Chinese merchants stop trading goods for gold and silver, and they start to sell goods for drugs. And so now you're taking, you know, something that you that you need, like silks and for to make clothes or or spices to make your food taste better, and you're trading them for things that you don't need, like drugs that you're gonna, you know, just go up and smoke. And so this balance of trade is really shifted uh, to the British. And so in trying to recapture that, in 1836, the Chinese pass a law banning opium and they start to execute opium dealers within china they're, they're, they're killing chinese citizens that are selling british drugs um, and then three years later in 1839 the chinese start to seize opium from british merchants as it comes into the country and this is going to lead to a conflict between britain and china and the fact that britain is going to look at this opium as uh, trade products or products that you know belong to them and the chinese are taking it the same way that they would take i don't know textiles or you know uh, military goods or whatever and so the british and the chinese are going to go to war not once but twice um, the first war is just between Britain and China, and that's the first opium war in which the British win uh, pretty pretty handily. And the second opium war um, is, is going to be more of a global effort against China. So, so nations like Portugal and France um, are going to, to join in in order to um, gain a better trade advantage over the Chinese. Uh, during this time frame, the British are basically arguing that they're fighting for trade. Uh, and free trade and the Chinese are going to see themselves as fighting for their way of life against really a foreign drug dealer who's trying to uh, to poison their citizens. And ultimately, that's what, what what's happening. But Britain, with its industrialized army and, 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 and large navy, can defeat the Chinese who have not industrialized. And so the British, by the 1800s, have steel boats. You know, they have boats made of iron or they have you know, metal uh, steam powered ships that are going to sail in their Navy and, and the Chinese are still using wind power and, and, uh, and wooden boats. And, and it, it's not going to take long for the British to basically wipe out the Chinese during this time frame. Uh, and they're going to take control of the island of Hong Kong and they're going to open up additional ports and they're going to uh, ensure that these ports, uh, these port cities are, are open year round. And China starts to lose uh, power and prestige on the global scale. They have the second opium war in which other nations are going to uh, fight China and, and do similar. And, and China's forced into this series of 
poor trade relations with uh, other European countries, right? Uh, the Quinn government's very corrupt and the common people are going to rise up against it. They're going to see, you know, this government is not being able to protect them from others. Uh, and you're going to have a revolution, the, the Taiping uh, revolution, which is one of the uh, largest civil wars in, in all of history, in which over somewhere between 20 to 30 million people are going to die in a, uh, in a two year span. Um, and, and before the government can can put a put a, put a uh, put an end to that, and so you know the Chinese government is is, is not uh, is not really doing its job protecting the Chinese people. They're not able to stand up to foreign nations. They're not able to stand up to uh, strife inside. And so other nations begin to section off China into spheres of influence. And we kind of talked about that in, in um, one of the earlier uh, lectures, in which if you think of China as a pie and it's divided up into sections, if you want uh, some an item out of a section that's controlled by Britain, you're not going to trade with the Chinese. You're actually going to trade with Britain to get that good out. And so foreign nations are not only controlling trade with China, they're also making huge profits uh, trading with other nations for Chinese goods, um, you know, in eighteen in eighteen ninety four, uh, China is going to fight a, a, a war, the first uh, uh, Sino uh, Chinese China war uh, with Japan, and Japan, who had started trading with America in the eighteen fifties, had bypassed the Japanese or the had bypassed the Chinese by the 1890s, uh, because they were trading for military technology and industrial knowledge to the point that, uh, you know, they'd become one of the more powerful nations in, um, in, in Asia. And, and so um, the Sino-Japanese war ends up with Japan uh, winning, and the rest of the world is kind of taken aback because Japan had always been kind of seen as this weak uh, Asian nation, and China has always been seen as the stronger of, the strongest of um, of those nations of Asia. And so Japan's going to take the huge island of Taiwan as a, as a part of this peace deal. Uh, and, and the rest of the world goes in and, and further divides up China for trade. Um, so Chinese nationalism um, sees this loss. Nationalists and Chinese nationalists start to see this loss as, to Japan as, as unacceptable. Uh, and they begin to revolt, just like we had our civil wars. Uh, and the most famous of these revolts is going to be the Boxer Rebellion, which is going to happen right around the turn of the nineteen uh, the nineteen hundreds, um, in, in which members of a, a club called uh, it's a it's a political kung fu club called the right, uh, Righteous Harmonious Fist, and they want to kick all of these foreigners out of China. And so they go around and they start to kill foreigners and and trade uh, merchants and and ambassadors and um and, and dignitaries from other countries and so these diplomats begin to flee to the capital city and they ask china for help in putting down this rebellion and the chinese are unable to uh, uh, control um this rebellion this boxer rebellion so western nations have to send in military to basically protect their own people and to save china from from themselves and so ultimately the west just gives china this huge bill like for this police action to to put down this revolt, uh, and it further places China in the debt of Western nations. Um, and really, all of this can be traced back to the introduction of opium into uh, Chinese society. Um, ultimately, China is going to be under control of, of the West or of Japan until the end of the Second World War. J Japan is going to take over large portions of China during World War II. Uh, following the Second World War, um, the United States and the West tries to uh, prop up a, demo a corrupt democratic uh, government, uh, which is ultimately overthrown with the Chinese uh, rebellion, or uh, I'm sorry, a Chinese communist uh, rebellion um, in 1950, I think it's 1948, um, when the Chinese uh, communists take control. Um, and, and China withdraws from international trade until really the mid 1970s when they reopen for trade uh, and they begin to industrialize um, uh, to the point where today, you know, they're, they're the world's second largest economy and, and one of the leaders in trade. Um, and so that's a little bit of Chinese imperialism. We kind of talked, touched on Japan earlier, but, you know, Japan had kind of stayed away from, um, kind of flown under the radar of this European industrial grab um, 
during you know India and China and those types of things and and the in the, the Japanese had traded with the Dutch for a little bit but um, really kind of controlled everything and it's not until 1853 when the United States sends uh, Commodore Matthew Perry uh, with his with his uh, naval fleet into uh, Tokyo Harbor and demands that Japan open for trade and basically gives the Japanese an offer that they can either open up for peaceful trade or they're going to be forcefully opened up for trade. And so Japan looks around the rest of Asia and they see that, hey, you know what, if I'm trading for consumer goods or whatever, things aren't going to work out so great. So what they do is they start to trade for, um, you know, technology and education and they send their best and their brightest to uh, Europe and to Amer America for military and and industrial uh, training and knowledge. And, and by 1900, you know, we talked about that, Japan is able to defeat China in warfare and become one of the most powerful Asian nations. Um, obviously one of the most powerful nations in Asia, if not one of the more powerful uh, uh, nations in the world to the point that by the second world war in the 1940s, you know, Japan is gonna, is gonna challenge America for dominance in Asia. And that's, uh, you know, really, that can be traced the, the the origins of the American Japanese conflict of of World War II can really be traced back to um, the 1850s and, and opening Japan up for trade. So that's going to do it for um, our brief introduction of uh, imperialism in Asia. Hopefully, we learned a little bit, and uh, and we'll come back and we'll see one of the uh, ramifications of imperialism, which is going to be the uh, First World War, uh, in our next lecture. So um, we'll see you then. Bye bye.